Dear students, welcome to the session on the history of immunology. We will discuss about the history of vaccines and the contribution of various scientists towards the understanding of the mechanisms of immunity. The term immunology was originated from the Latin word immunus, which means exempt. It means the state of protection from infectious disease. The branch of immunology started from the observation that individuals who recovered from certain infectious diseases never developed the same disease. The immune system possesses the hallmarks such as diversity, specificity, memory and self-non-self -self recognition. This is a highly specific response which can differentiate one foreign pathogen from another and it can also discriminate between self and non-self antigens. Once a foreign invader organism is recognized, the immune system will elicit an effective response which will eliminate or neutralize the organism and a later exposure to the same foreign organism will induce a more rapid and enhanced immune reaction known as the memory response. The earliest written reference to immunity was by Thucydides, the great historian of the Peloponnesian War. In 430 BC, while describing a plague in Athens, he wrote that only those who had recovered from the plague could nurse the sick because they will not contract the disease a second time. The first recorded attempts to induce immunity deliberately was performed by the Chinese and Turks in the 15th century. The dried crust from the smallpox pestures were either inhaled through nostrils or inserted into cuts in the skin, a technique known as variolation. They performed this technique to prevent the deadly and fatal smallpox. Lady Mary Mondeyu, the wife of the British ambassador to the Constantinople, performed the technique of variolation on her own children. This technique of variolation was significantly improved by the English physician Edward Jenner. He observed that milkmaids who had the cowpox disease were immune to smallpox. He reasoned that fluid from a cowpox pustule, if introduced into a pupil, might protect them from smallpox. He inoculated an 8-year-old boy with fluid from a cowpox pustule, and later he intentionally infected the child with smallpox. As correctly predicted by Jenner, the child did not develop smallpox he became immune towards the smallpox disease. Thereafter, this technique to protect against smallpox spread quickly throughout Europe. Edward Jenner is honored as the father of immunology. But this technique was not applied to other diseases for nearly a hundred years due to the lack of obvious disease targets and knowledge. Serendipity in combination with astute observation lead to the next major advance in immunology. Louis Pasteur was successful in growing the bacterium responsible for foul cholera in culture. And he showed that when chickens were injected with this bacterial culture, they developed cholera. After a summer vacation during which the cultures were left in incubation for a long period of time, he observed that the long incubation attenuated the bacteria, that is, the bacteria lost their ability to cause the disease. Pasteur injected some chickens with this old culture and to Pasteur's surprise, even though the chickens became ill, they recovered. Pasteur then used a fresh culture of the bacterium to inject into fresh chickens. But since his supply of chickens was limited, he had to use the previously injected chickens. Now again, to his surprise, the chickens were completely protected. They did not develop the disease. Pasteur hypothesis and proved that aging weakened the virulence of the pathogen and administering such an attenuated strain will protect against the disease. He called this attenuated strain as a vaccine and this name came from the Latin word vacca, which means cow. He named it so in honor of Jenner's technique of cowpox inoculation. 
Pasteur extended his approach to other diseases and demonstrated that it is possible to attenuate or weaken a pathogen and administer this attenuated strain as a vaccine. He studied Bacillus anthracis, which is a causative agent of anthrax, and he was successful in attenuating the bacterium. Pasteur and Chamberlain developed attenuation techniques to prepare anthrax vaccine in two ways either by heating cultures with potassium bichromate or by incubating the bacteria at 42 to 43 degrees Celsius. In 1881, Pasteur vaccinated a group of sheep with heat attenuated bacillus anthracis and then infected the sheep, both the vaccinated sheep and some unvaccinated sheep with a virulent culture of the bacillus. He observed that all the vaccinated sheep lived and all the unvaccinated animals died indicating the potential of the attenuated anthrax bacillus as a vaccine. Pasteur used a different approach to prepare rabies vaccine. The pathogen was attenuated by growing it in an abnormal host, the rabbit. And after the death of the infected rabbits, their brains and spinal cords were removed and dried. In 1885, Pasteur administered his first vaccine to a young boy Joseph Mister, who had been bitten by a rabid dog. His death was almost certain. So Joseph was injected 13 times with the rabies vaccine over the next 10 days with the virulent preparations of the attenuated virus. And Joseph Mister survived. He was protected from the deadly lethal rabies virus. These experiments mark the beginning of the discipline of immunology. With contributions from all over the world, Pasteur Institute was constructed in Paris and the initial task of the institute was vaccine production. The German physician Robert Koch established the relationship between bacillus anthracis and anthrax in 1876. He injected healthy mice with materials from diseased animals and the mice became ill. After transferring anthrax by inoculation and culturing of bacilli through a series of mice and beef serum, he proved the relationship between the microorganism and a specific disease. He proposed the Cox postulates summarized as follows. The microorganism must be present in every case of the disease, but absent from healthy organisms. The suspected microorganism must be isolated and grown in a pure culture. The same disease must result when the isolated microorganism is inoculated into a healthy host. The same microorganism must be isolated again from the diseased host. In 1890, Emil Behring and Kitasato injected inactivated diphtheria toxin into rabbits inducing them to produce an antitoxin to inactivate the toxin and to protect themselves against the disease. It was demonstrated that the serum from animals immunized to diphtheria could transfer the immune state to unimmunized animals. Their work gave insights into the mechanism of immunity. A tetanus antitoxin was also prepared by them. Various researchers during the next decade demonstrated that an active component from the serum of immune animals are capable of neutralizing toxins, precipitating toxins, and agglutinate bacteria. They were termed as antitoxin, precipitin, and agglutinin, respectively. During 1930s, Elvin Kabat showed that gamma globulin present in serum is responsible for these activities. This active molecule is known as antibodies. Since the immunity mediated by antibodies are present in body fluids or humors, it was called humoral immunity. Modern immunology begins with the research of Mechnikov. In 1883, Elie Mechnikov observed that 
certain white blood cells which he termed as phagocytes were able to ingest or phagocytose microorganisms and other foreign material. Metnikov hypothesized that these cells are the major effectors of immunity and he introduced the concept cell mediated immunity. Further studies on serum and humoral immunity were possible due to the readily available blood and established biochemical techniques. While the studies on the activities of immune cells were done later only with the development of modern tissue culture techniques. As a result, information about cellular immunity lagged behind than that of humoral immunity. In 1940s, Merrill Chase transferred immunity against tuberculosis by transferring white blood cells from immune guinea pigs. In 1950s, with the emergence of cell culture techniques, lymphocytes were identified as a cell responsible for both cellular and humoral immunity. Bruce Glick with studies using chickens indicated that there are two types of lymphocytes. T lymphocytes from thymus in mediated cellular immunity and B lymphocytes from the bursa of Fabricius in birds mediated humoral immunity. It was understood that the two systems work in an intertwined manner for the immune response. In around 1900, Jules Baudet demonstrated specific immune reactivity to non-pathogenic substances such as red blood cells from different species. The work of Carl Landsteiner showed that injecting an animal with almost any organic chemical could induce production of antibodies that would bind specifically to that particular chemical. He demonstrated the human ABO blood tube system. He identified the underlying mechanism by which clumping or agglutination of red blood cells occur during mixing of blood from two individuals. Landsteiner identified antigens present on RBC which interact with host antibodies which results in the immunological reaction of blood clotting. Landsteiner's work made it possible for blood transfusions to be carried out safely. He also discovered other blood factors such as the M, N and P factors and also the rhesus system. Landsteiner and Levaditi discovered the causative agent responsible for poliomyelitis and they worked for the development of polio vaccine. Landsteiner worked to identify the microorganism responsible for syphilis and he using small organic molecules called haptens demonstrated how small variations in a molecule's structure can cause great changes in antibody production. These studies demonstrated that antibodies have almost unlimited range of reactivity even to compounds never before existed in nature which are synthesized recently in a laboratory. Also, highly structurally similar molecules could be recognized as different molecules by antibodies. The selective theory and the instructional theory were proposed to explain these phenomena. Selective theory was detailed by Paul Ehrlich in 1900. Ehrlich proposed that cells in the blood expressed a variety of receptors which he called side chain receptors. These side chain receptors could react and bind with infectious agents in a way similar to the fit between a lock and a key. This interaction between an infectious agent and a cell receptor induce the cell to produce and release more receptors with the same specificity. As per this theory, the specificity of the receptor was determined before its exposure to antigen and the antigen just selected the appropriate receptor. In 1930s and 1940s, the selective theory was challenged by instructional theories by Frederick Brain and Felix Horowitz. According to the instructional theories, a particular antigen would serve as a template around which antibody would fold and the antibody molecule will, would assume a complementary configuration. 
the instructional theories were disproved in 1960s. In 1950s, selective theories were made resurface and it was refined by Niels Jern, David Talmadge and F. McFarlane Burnett as the clonal selection theory. According to this theory, an individual lymphocyte expresses membrane receptors that are specific for a distinct antigen even before the lymphocyte is exposed to the antigen. Binding of antigen to its specific receptor activates the cell, causing the cell to proliferate into a clone of cells that have the same immunological specificity as the parent cell. In the image, a hematopoietic stem cell undergoes differentiation and genetic rearrangement to produce immature lymphocytes with many different antigen receptors. Those cells that bind to self-antigens, that is antigens from own tissue, are destroyed. The rest cells mature into inactive lymphocytes. When such inactive lymphocytes encounter a matching foreign antigen, they will get activated and produce many clones themselves. This is a clonal selection theory and the clonal selection theory is accepted as the underlying paradigm of modern immunology. So, we were discussing about the history of immunology. As we discussed, this is a discipline that arose after the pioneering approaches of Edward Jenner when he introduced the smallpox vaccine in 1798. About after 100 years later, Louis Pasteur propelled immunology further into universal awareness. This science has only become mature in the past 50 years. Research works are being done to recognize the role of various types of immune cells and their intricate connection between them. Thank you so much for listening.